Ireland's leaders are completely out of touch with the people that they govern and now there's been a referendum that proves it. They've rejected the culture war, they are embracing tradition. So does that mean that the people of Ireland need to be persecuted with new hate laws and censorship laws? Or does it just mean that the Irish people and their leaders need to separate, ironically get a divorce? <laughs> Hello there, you Awakening Wonders. Thanks for joining me on this voyage to truth and freedom. Click the link in the description to support our movement as we continue to examine and explore the disparity between the cultural elites that govern and the rest of us and the variations and cultural distinctions and differences that would exist in any enormous population. One thing's for sure, the offering of the Irish elite to the Irish people has been resoundingly rejected. They wanted to change the wording around family and the roles of women within the family and they asked the Irish people, do you want to make these changes? And the Irish people said no. So we're going to have a look at that referendum or that pair of referenda and what it means and how it can be used to demonstrate that increasingly what we have is an elite class that use progressivism to condemn entire populations as somehow out of touch and lost in the midst of time. And I think that what's happening in Ireland exemplifies a global phenomena that's of course happening everywhere. The ruling elites of America don't like ordinary American people and want to condemn them. The ruling elites in the UK don't like the British and want to condemn them. And I feel that what will emerge from this is a new type of politics and it's fascinating to see it evolve. Just because it's coming from the past, it doesn't mean that it's entirely nostalgic. What it means is people are rejecting this new agenda that seeks to wipe away everything of value that includes family and tradition, but also quite deep-seated ideas like our connection to the divine, nature and God. Let's get into this new story and work out what it means for us as an awakening planet. We start with breaking news. The Irish Prime Minister has conceded defeat in the nation's referenda on modernising its constitution. Modernising its constitution. It's one of those referendums where all of the major parties backed a particular answer. A lot like Brexit, really, or a lot like how all of the media don't want Americans to vote for Trump. The whole establishment class is telling you, do this, do this. And the whole population is curiously saying, we're not doing that, or at least a significant portion of the population. In many cases, enough to win elections. This is a real problem for the ruling elite. Leo Varadkar says it was already clear the amendments over the definition of family and the woman's role at home had been defeated. Well, that's despite the counting of votes still taking place. Um, well, speaking in the last hour, Mr Radka said his government accepted full responsibility. Uh, this is the quote. It says, it was our responsibility to convince the majority of people to vote yes, and we clearly failed to do so. It's fascinating because Ireland's got a very particular history that's built in adversity to the UK and therefore facilitates a relationship with the EU that's perhaps a little more favourable. But now these kind of bureaucratic and centralised authoritarian forces have become completely deracinated from the people in various territories that they purport to govern, believing in ideas of cultural progressivism, which undoubtedly have their place and are, in my view, matters of personal freedom. But Ireland, with its long affiliation with Catholicism is going to have a very particular social perspective. Ireland with its long military opposition to the UK and the oppressive forces and religious oppression that came out of the UK are going to have a very particular perspective. And something that goes even beyond that is populations have the right to determine for themselves whether or not they want to be pro or anti-immigration, whether or not they want to be pro or anti-marriage. That's something that in a democracy you can decide for yourselves. My personal view is, is that people have the right to consensual express their sexuality with loving partners or perfect strangers in the context of consent. But if a country votes that what they want to revere, honour and enshrine is the traditional family, then I suppose they have the right to do that, don't they? Hugely embarrassing for the Irish government this. This was a referendum or two referendums, as you mentioned there, that no government in this country ever expected to lose. For many years here, commentators and the governments thought that when we eventually got around to having a referendum addressing this outdated language, 
damage that it would pass with ease. But this has been a lesson in how not to run a referendum campaign by Leo Varadkar and his government. It also might be a bigger lesson in the way that the world is changing, how quickly the world is changing, and how many of the cultural, social and economic experiments that define our planet at this time are failing. They're not working for a good many people. Whether you're voting for Trump or Brexit, one interpretation of that electoral process and preference could be a rejection of the neoliberal establishment and their ideas. And that's a kind of understandable position when we seem to be experiencing decline, dishonesty, deception, and even, at worst, a type of nihilism and a deliberate attempt to make us all feel sort of bewildered, like nothing is certain and none of our traditions have any meaning. But I can tell you in the count centres, it was obvious from very early on this morning when we watched the first boxes being opened and the tallies conducted of the uh, the ballot papers within, it was very obvious right across the Dublin constituencies and right across the rural constituencies, a consistent trend. People were giving this government a bloody nose today. It's a brilliant article from Spike that analyses this result. The referendum's proposing changes to the constitutional definition of family and on the issue of care were comprehensively defeated in Ireland last week, with the latter rejected by a record margin. Voters were asked to say yes or no to two amendments to the Constitution of 1937. First, they were asked if they wanted to change the meaning of the word family so that it would extend beyond marriage to include other durable relationships. Then they were asked if they'd like to change the Constitution's focus on a woman's duties in the home by adding a new clause acknowledging that all sorts of family members provide care in the domestic setting. The political class invested huge amounts of money and energy into encouraging voters to say yes to these sweeping tweaks, but voters refused to play ball. 68% said no to altering the definition of family and 74% said no to updating the section on a woman's duties. It was a crushing defeat for the establishment. Fianna Fáil, Finn Gael and Sinn Féin all lined up behind yes. Dublin's chattering class is fuming with the voters. They've rejected an opportunity to extract Ireland from the constitutional straitjacket of Catholic social teaching and anachronistic views about women and girls, says one columnist. This vision of certain Irish people as anachronistic and the constitution itself as hopelessly outdated is widespread among the educated classes. Indeed, Taoiseach Leo Varadkar has said it was time to change the very old-fashioned, very sexist language about women in the constitution. Thank the Lord we can bring you this content because of the support of our sponsors. Support them if you can. Today I want to talk to you about Field of Greens. It's the healthiest thing I do every day and I want you on this journey with me, side by side. It's literally one scoop a day. It tastes great. My favourite is the original flavour and it's completely improved my life. This is nutrition, the way that nature intended in a scoop. Here's what I noticed since I started taking Field of Greens. Way more energy over the course of the day. Sleeping better at night like a baby. As you know, they're truculent and difficult at night time, so I sleep better than one. Healthier hair and skin. It helps with my digestion. My stomach feels better. I feel better overall and I think healthier and stronger. Field of Greens is radically different. Each organic fruit and vegetable was medically chosen to support the heart and vital organ health. I trust Field of Greens to keep me healthy. I I promise you're going to love this product, but if for any reason you don't, they'll give you 100% money back guarantee. Now listen, I've got you 15% off your first order, plus free rush shipping. Visit BrickHouseRussell.com and use promo code BRAND. That's promo code BRAND at BrickHouseRussell.com. They'll know I sent you. Okay, let's get back to the story. In the elite's eyes, presumably, the folk who said no to this project of modernization are both very old-fashioned and very sexist. It's possible, of course, that people have a different view on what those roles constitute. I participate a good deal in the care of my own children and the fact that in our household that duty is primarily undertaken by the mother is not seen as a denigrated role but an elevated one. In truth voters were defending their way of life. They were standing up for institutions and ideas that matter hugely to them. Marriage, motherhood, against the unilateral meddling of a distant establishment. That's important as well isn't it? That people feel more connected to their family and their community and their church and their values to this class of institutions that appear to have some other aim in mind and those aims don't appear to be taking us anywhere very pleasant very fast. They understand that adding other forms of durable relationships alongside marriage in the constitution will represent an implicit demotion of the importance of marriage. The specialness of marriage is diluted when it's treated as just another relationship. It clearly feels alien to elites of a globalist bent that ordinary people still put so much store by marriage, but they do. Dublin's elite might derive their sense of meaning and clout from modern forms of networking and ideological camaraderie, but others prefer the rooted experience of lifelong commitment. For many, marriage is their most important source of solidarity. I would say that in a vote in to honour a traditional perspective that needn't be prejudicial to people that are in same-sex relationships or even un 
not married. Love is love. Partnership is partnership. But I suppose what they're saying is marriage is a very particular ceremony that is about religious faith and is in particular about a declaration before God. And also, by the way, there was a vote on it and the people voted this way. The elites are rolling out their excuses for why they failed to get their way. The referendum questions were worded badly. Voters were hoodwinked by the far right, etc, etc. In truth, the dual referendum represented an existential clash of values and the values the elites don't like won the day. To many of us, it makes perfect sense that ordinary people would go out to defend the institution of marriage and the traditional family. After all, these are institutions in which people take refuge from the vagaries of market society and cultivate their own spaces of love, independence and solidarity. That strikes me as a very important line. At the moment, the world feels sort of bewildering, nihilistic, cold and harsh, corrupted, owned by very particular sets of power and your own family and your own values and your own relationship with the sacred and divine, your own personal sovereignty are very important ideas. It's odd to imagine that the state would be interested in anything other than facilitating the further advances of elite institutions, both economic and state, and the declaration that they're interested in the equality of types of relationship and types of marriages, I think the people have smelt as bogus and untrue, based on the actions of these institutions. The instinct of the post-national elites might be to throw open everything, the state, society, community, to the requirements of global capital, but the instinct of others is to do the opposite, to batten down the hatches of home life against what they rightly perceive to be the economic and ideological menaces of neoliberalism. Even more important, the resounding no vote was a defence of the past from an elite that prefers the constant churn of modernisation to any appeals to tradition. Varadkar's invitation to the Irish people to overhaul the very old-fashioned language of the constitution was telling. It spoke to the elite's agitation with all things old, their discomfort with history itself. You get the impression these days that the Dublin establishment is mortified that it runs a country that was once so religious and so rural. Way Waging ceaseless war on Ireland's own past is increasingly the means through which Ireland's new rulers seek to demonstrate their moral fitness for membership of the globalist superclass. National self-loathing is a variable industry in modern Ireland. Cultural influencers have reimagined the past as a constant hell of Magdalene laundries, spiteful priests, alcoholism, stupidity and petty nationalism. Virtually every Irish film and novel is a depressing tale of how ignorance once reigned supreme on this benighted isle. The old English caricatures of the Irish as a feckless race have nothing on the new Dublin elite's caricature of the Irish as the damaged victims of a demagogic church and nationalist strongmen. You don't have to think old Ireland was perfect to recognise that these grotesque renderings of Irish history are less about historical truth than about proving the virtue of the new elite by constantly contrasting it with the vices of the old. So history is being desecrated and cast aside. We're all aware that there were certain and obvious problems with the Catholic Church and that there is certain room for progress, tolerance, inclusion when it comes to different ways of identifying through your sexuality and identity. But the right of people to revere, to love their tradition and ancestors is not only, one might argue, a necessity, but something that is inherently human. And increasingly as we see progress fumble and fail, technology further facilitate tyranny rather than the ease and comfort it promises, it's pretty obvious that one of the things that people are reaching towards is the sense of comfort that comes from loving, for example, your own grandparents and not regarding them as bigoted old fools. Last week's dual referendums must be seen in this cultural context as the latest elite effort to unanchor Ireland from its past, to liberate the nation from its historical shame. In spurning this invitation, in refusing to disavow the very old-fashioned and very sexist founding document of their nation, voters were not only saying screw you to the current establishment, they were also revolting against the cult of year zero, against the frenzied disembedding of nations from their pasts. This is a core part of the woke project, the inculcation of historical shame in the public in order that they might agree to be delivered into a newer, better, woker future by a self-styled, enlightened ruling class. This is perhaps the most I've ever understood the cultural damage that apparent progressivism can do. In the same way that I can easily identify that technology promises to facilitate ease for all of us, but ultimately ends up being used to facilitate the control of the establishment and the profits of already wealthy institutions and corporations. Wokeism pretends that it's about equality and caring for the values of people that might be oppressed. And these are important arguments that need to be honoured in some way. But it seems that these cultural arguments, as the author of this piece suggests, are used to disable and destabilise communities and individuals' relationships with their own past and their own values. Suddenly something important makes sense. And it's a project the Irish people have just said no to. 
Across the West, performative hostility to one's history is all the rage in establishment circles. You see it in the US, in the efforts of media elites to alter the very founding date of America from 1776, the year of the American Revolution, to 1619, the year slaves first arrived. You see it in the UK, where the National Trust lectures us about our history of slavery. The Church of England issues solemn apologies for its links with colonialism, and bourgeois youths tear down statues of problematic people and demand the renaming of buildings and streets. You see it in the European Union, which depicts everything that happened prior to 1945 as iffy and archaic, and everything since then as a gallant effort to socially re-engineer the continent as a woke, peaceful entity. I feel when I read that that you can't have your cake and eat it. You can't keep the nation and then strip out everything that keeps its structures in place. If you feel there is something inherently patriarchal and therefore wrong about structure, then you have to review it in its entirety. You can't keep its financial structures, its institutions of government, and just change some of the edifices and statues while maintaining the true power in its place. Globalist, elite, unassailable and unattainable for most. It seems that people are content to alter words here and there to change the superficial arrangements but never address the true nature of power. In short, if you want to radically realter the way that power operates, then you're going to have to do away with the concept of the nation itself, rather than say, we have a nation, but now this nation doesn't mean the historic struggle against British oppression and Michael Collins in 1916 and all of the historic fights of the Irish people and the famine. Now it means all this new stuff. You can't say that because those people don't have those memories. They don't have that tradition. They don't have that past. And you can't, because of that, just tell them that they're stupid. And in Ireland, you see it everywhere in culture, entertainment, politics. Witness not only the fashionable shame the smart set feels towards the Catholic era, but also their bristling disdain for the very founding of the nation. Even Easter 1916 is an embarrassment to the new elite that prefers to pool its sovereignty in the EU rather than stand up for the territorial sanctity of the Republic. That young men and women died in order that Ireland might govern itself is mortifying to these knowledge industry elites who prefer to be governed from Brussels, and so they distance themselves even from the ideals of Irish independence. We want nothing to do with a backward-looking idea of sovereignty, said then leader of the opposition and now Tornishta, Michael Martin, in 2017. Instead, Ireland is absolutely committed to the EU, he decreed. Nationhood is out. Subservience to globalist institutions is in. The educated position today is the rise of Above the past to look down on it, to distance oneself from yesteryear's very old-fashioned ideals. Ordinary people's refusal to do this, their stubborn insistence on valuing history and its achievements, bemuses the elites as much as it horrifies them. To the rest of us, though, again, it makes sense. People want to feel connected to history, to place, to their own part in the story of their community. The elite suggestion that we disavow all of this is ultimately a demand that we disavow ourselves. Modern Ireland, more than any other European nation, reveals the destructive truth about woke. There is a tendency to see woke as a joke, as the daft pastime of bourgeois blue hairs, as the ideological exuberance of posh kids led astray on campus. In truth, woke is a mammoth elite project whose fundamental aim is to remake and improve the masses. It is a process of dehistoricization, deterritorialization, and demoralization. That is, it seeks to rent us from our own history by inducing shame towards the past. It aims to deprive us of a meaningful connection to territory by diluting national sovereignty and moving us ever closer to a globalist system of governance. And it longs to re-educate us out of our problematic morals, our very old-fashioned beliefs in things like family, marriage, motherhood, even biological sex, through the relentless promotion of supposedly better, more enlightened ways of thinking about social relations. Ireland is further advanced than most in this authoritarian project. Shame about 1916, open disdain for sovereignty, never-ending alarm over the religious excesses of the 20th century. This is the stuff of intellectual discourse among Dublin's movers and shakers. There are few cultural elites as boastfully alienated from their history and their people as Ireland. That's what the dual referendum really represented, a further attempt to entrench the cultural power of this new establishment and to diminish the very old-fashioned morality of the masses. The elite's stunning defeat in this staged clash over history and over meaning itself is an important moment. What many people instinctively recognise is that the enforced alienation of them from their own history territory and morality would render them more malleable to the new ruling class. It would make them blank slates onto which the year zero elites could write whatever story and ideology they wanted. In such circumstances, people's clinging to 
tradition. Their pulling up of the blanket of the past is not anachronistic, it's survival. It's an act of self-protection against an establishment that prefers us suggestible rather than rooted and confident. Family, community, tradition. These are people's last remaining shields against the true ignoble fanatics, our year zero rulers. Often when you hear about a globalist project, a great reset, the idea that we will be uprooted and lost, that a new set of rules, a new agenda will be imposed. It's difficult to see how such a vast and expansive project could ever be understood. But through the unique lens of Ireland's politics and the deep sympathy that that nation engenders through their own historic struggles, you can see, as you could with the immigration struggles of a few months ago, that what's happening is a transplanted ideology is being dropped on it from above. And when you can understand it about Ireland, you can see how it's happening in the UK, how it's happening in the United States. And the fact that the history of your country, America, and our country is beset with problems of imperialism and colonialism doesn't mean that ordinary working people that live in our nations now should have their rights similarly dispatched. The dismissal of Catholic values, for example, is very similar to what British imperialists would have said about the Hindu folk and Muslim folk in India and what is now Pakistan. (laughs) Although, Jesus, what an extraordinary concoction those national projects are when you think about it. They would have laughed about the gods and the elephant gods and the monkey gods thinking that it is their duty to impose Christ upon those nations. And now you see that the very same game is being played out through bureaucracy with the woke ideology forging a new pantheon of gods and ideals with which to supplant the previous traditions and communities and values that the people in these referenda have said, no, 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 we're keeping that. That's our grandparents. That's our streets. That's That's our lives. That's our memories, our Christmases and our Easter's and our pain and funerals that we've been to. Funerals sometimes that were a result of the kind of establishmentism that you're now trying to re-render in a banal and rational way. But every bit as insidious as the funerals that were held across the country of Ireland because of previous more militaristic forms of colonialism. Ireland has become hyperwoke. Its elites are fully converted to the gender cult. They promote the ruthless policing of hate speech, which really means dissent. They damn as far right anyone who raises a peep of criticism about immigration. Their culture war on the past is relentless. Woke is the state religion of Ireland now. And if you thought Catholic Ireland was sexist, irrational and illiberal, just wait until you see what wokeness unleashes. Science made subservient to ideology. Dissenters rebranded as haters and threatened with censorship and possibly even jail. Ireland's godless new ruling class is easily as backward and tyrannical as any of the priests of old. The irony is too much. In ostentatiously distancing themselves from bad old religious Ireland, the elites have created a system of neo-religious dogmas that makes the Catholic era seem positively progressive in comparison. This new clerisy is far more reactionary, far more menacing to liberty and reason than the little old lady who pops a miraculous medal in with her ballot paper. Long may the blasphemy against its ideology continue. Well, there you are. It seems that across the world, globalism and this new imperialism is being rejected and continually is necessary for it to be reframed as a kind of terrorism or a kind of hatred, a kind of domestic war against important and somehow holy new values, when quite the reverse might be true. That people are sensing that what's being imposed is something terrible, tyrannical, authoritarian, nihilistic all at once. And whenever there's an opportunity for anything remarkable remotely resembling an election. The people speak pretty clearly as they have done in Ireland. No wonder elections these days are subject of so much controversy and control, whether it's the media controlling the elections, social media censoring true debate and potentially even more nefarious activity than that. And in a year of elections, which is what 2024 is, we're going to see a lot more stories like this one. So stay tuned and stay free. But that's just what I think. Why don't you let me know what you think in the comments in the chat. Remember, click the link in the description, become a member of our movement. We make content like this all the time. We have additional videos and additional meetings. We're planning all sorts of crazy stuff. There are videos on chemtrails. There's videos on Kate Middleton. There are videos on subjects that are difficult to discuss in mainstream spaces. But most of all, we're interested in how power operates and how power asserts its influence through conventional media channels. More important than any of that, if you can, please stay free. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to, or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.